All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are live. Welcome to Unity V, and also hi to the podcast people listening to the sound of movement. Thrilled to be back. Uh, we have an epic uh, guest to interview and um, introduce you guys to today. Someone who I've known for many, many years uh, now and uh, someone who honestly I think is uh, gonna, has the potential to be one of the best physical therapists in the country uh, in the future. He's dedicated the last eight years to rigorous study and I'm talking full-time, third degree, uh, well, diploma and then two degrees. Uh, and he's now doing a, 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 a doctorate in physiotherapy. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, doctor of physiotherapy course at Macquarie Uni. Yep, so that's not right. a PhD, but uh, an extended master's. But it's an extended master's. With a fancy it's, title. It, it, with, a, <laughs> with a very fancy title. He is none other than Phil White, currently working uh, as a um, lead a head massage therapist down at Cartwright Physical Therapy. He's had a truckload of experience, not only massaging weekend warriors like myself, but massaging real athletes. He worked for uh, a stint at the greater, the GWS Giants as a massage therapist, working under Leroy Lobo, who's a good friend of mine and, and, and arguably one of the best physios in the country. And um, yeah, look, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump over to Phil so he can introduce himself and say hello to you guys. Hi guys, it's great to be here. It's uh, nice to take our uh, conversations out of the massage room and you know share it with some people because yeah, we usually cover some interesting uh, some interesting topics just uh, the two of us. So yeah, good to good to good to be chatting. Absolutely, I'd actually be looking at you whilst we're chatting. Yeah, instead <laughs> of seeing your ugly, the back of, ugly back of your head. That's right. That's right. So I'm pretty excited. We've got um, a slightly different setup going on here. Obviously, uh, Rad isn't joining us this morning, um, so it's just me and Phil, but uh, we're still going to absolutely crush it. We've got a couple of really good topics to talk about. The first one is um, backed off uh, a conversation that we actually had on the massage table. Phil and I talk a bit on the massage table. It's uh, sometimes the only time I get with him outside of his rigorous study regime. And also uh, any, any um, time he's got left, uh, he's usually swimming, mountain bike riding, hiking, and all sorts of other great things like that, which I'll, uh, I'll leave uh, him to uh, talk about. So let's start with that, mate. Um, tell me a little bit about your sporting background. Yeah, so I started, uh, I mean, I've always been pretty involved with sport after my, I was a chubby little kid and my mum called me a slug once and kind of <laughs> got to me as a <laughs> seven-year-old and, um, you know, started riding my bike to school and that sort of, like, went from being uh, not at all active to being, yeah, to being pretty active. So played a bit of, you know, soccer as a kid, but then when I found Ultimate Frisbee when I was uh, 14, which may be a sport that a few of you haven't heard of before, but team sport with a disc instead of a ball, uh, Lots of lots of running, sprinting, diving for frisbees. Um, yeah, I got pretty involved with that when I was 14. Played that uh, pretty much non-stop for 11 years. Um, took me to five world championships, so a good way to travel the world, meet lots of friends, and um, injure myself plenty of times. So you yeah. went to a really high level. Anyone quick, just quickly jumping out. Um, I don't want to keep interrupting Phil, but. Um, Anyone who hasn't seen Ultimate Frisbee, Google it and see how big it is in uh, like over in the states and things like that. I was quite amazed. Like they pull, pull huge crowds at the yeah, uni the, games the, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, the, the college scene's pretty big. It's on ESPN three now, I think. So working its way. Yep. Um, and there's a professional league over there. And, and a bit of a shout out to the Australian uh, Ultimate League, which is now a professional league that's starting. Uh, just in, like I think they have got the actual comp this week. So there's it's getting there in Australia as well. So. Awesome. Epic, epic. And, uh, and so when did that finish up? So I, I played that until about two years ago. And um, yeah, just after spending, you know, most weekends traveling to the, the same tournaments year after year and sort of like ending up with quite a few injuries that would be a, the same kind of recurring stuff that I, I'd, I'd address. And then, you know, like team sports, you have some unfortunate sort of collisions and, and whatnot that can just end, end an injury. So I, I took a bit of, um, I decided to take one season off just to get my body right after uh, uh, World Championships and um, uh, spent a bit more time in the gym and just fell in love with spending more time at the gym. So I did a bit of uh, powerlifting for about six months, which was good. Never wanted to compete, but just really enjoyed learning the techniques and, and, and strengthening my body a bit, which really yep. helped. And, and that, then that was down at base gym. Yeah, at base uh, gym. Sebastian with, um, Oreb. Sebastian yep. Oreb. So yep. he travels around the world doing seminars and teaching lifting techniques. So having, uh, you know, being able to learn from some, someone like that has been uh, been really great. And, and definitely you did, sorry to cut you off. You didn't just do a little bit of powerlifting. I, I'm pretty sure I caught you lifting like 
What was your max deadlift? It was up there. It was well, you know, compared to the some of the guys over there, it was uh, you know less than half of what some of those guys would be doing. <laughs> but you know, for myself, who's definitely more of an endurance athlete, doing 180 for you know three reps, you I was were re- pretty you happy were with that. You were repping 180 kilos. I actually so, saw that uh, video go up. It's, yeah, um, and for someone, I used impressive. to have quite a bit of back pain back in the day, so it feels nice to you know to get that level and and you know have that feeling strong and good and not just uh yeah you know repping out some some painful reps it's it's funny just very quickly when you uh when you train around really strong people i had this experience when bass and the guys were actually still here at unity uh you you feel very um sort of weak in in comparison but when you when you compare yourself to people just an average person that hits a gym you're actually really really strong (laughs) yeah i mean to give context there was a 14 year old kid repping 18 for five reps next to me so you know it kind of uh, <laughs> yeah and there's a guy in the back doing 300 kilo good morning so yeah, yeah, yeah it, it kind right. of makes you think that maybe you could probably get through your set and it's yeah fun. oh but, that's um, awesome yeah and definitely enjoyed training there but uh after that i went back in um and got a bit more involved in triathlons and um i've always loved uh running and and bike riding and uh did a ocean swimming course with my mum, who's a 65 year old lady who found her love of exercise here actually. So I um, remember. Yeah, big, big thank you to yep. um, to you guys for, you know, just giving her that like, that structured approach to exercise where, you know, it was a definitely a, a bit of a, um, something in her mind that she thought that, you know, it wasn't for her, the gym wasn't for her, but I just love the setup here so much where it's really geared towards people who, you know, haven't spent much time in the gym and have a certain idea about what gyms are like. and. That's actually what I was like when I remember you first inviting me along to the gym. I was like, oh, nah, gyms aren't for me. And came up here once and then I think I was here five days a week for two years straight. So, yep, yep. Yeah, so I think, you know, giving my mum that opportunity was really great. And she ended up going into a hiking training group, which then she was introduced through there to the um, Cantu programs and did a learn to swim. And I joined her awesome. in that. So, yeah, I got into triathlons and uh, that meant that I... For long, like I put off playing frisbee for another. I decided to take another season, so six months off, and then um, yep, yeah, end up getting into mountain biking and off-road triathlons, which are definitely a big passion. And now um, yeah, kept kept that going. And my latest thing is volleyball. So really, uh, <laughs> beach volleyball specifically. Yep. So um, and yeah, it's just been a really enjoyable experience going from playing ultimate frisbee so intensely for so long, and then now just trying out different things and sort of seeing like as a as someone who treats athletes from all sorts of different realms, I think it's really important to give different sports a go and that way you sort of understand what training intensely for something is like and um, you understand the different, uh, I guess, um, yeah, demands that different sports put on your body. So yep. no, it's been uh, been fun and I think my clients appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's something, we were gonna tip on this a bit later, but we may as well go straight into it because uh, you, um, your training, has changed a lot over the last couple of years that I've watched you and you now have, uh, you, you know, listening to your um, uh, uh, story there, you're like the ultimate generalist uh, from, from the way that we look at things uh, um, as opposed to when you were doing ultimate frisbee as a specialist. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so the injuries that you were occurring when you were doing that specialisation stuff, do you think that it's made a big difference to your body, sort of spreading the, the load more evenly? Yeah, certainly. I mean, like, Frisbee kind of took a bit of a journey from when I first started to when I, when I finished playing. So when I first started playing, you know, conventional wisdom was that you should do, th- you know, three, five kilometre runs a week and, and then just play as many games as you possibly can. And so knowing what I know now, you can see how that doesn't exactly prepare you for the, like a 5K run, isn't exactly going to specialise you towards being able to do repeated sprint efforts, changing direction, uh, jumping, diving, all those sort of things. And yep. playing lots of games just puts you at... Uh, you know, it gives you plenty of opportunities for, for risk of, of injury because there's just so yep. many, you know, uh, things happening in a game that, that, that could end up in hurting so in hurting you. So, um, yeah, so going from the... That was how training was when, when I first started. But to the end, you know, people started getting uh, much more specialised into... As, as Ultimate became more competitive, it was lots of explosive work, lots of, um, you know, it was either in the gym doing... Uh, yeah, power training basically and then trying to translate that into as many sprint sessions as you yep. can do in the gym and um, uh, you can on do out field. on, on the yep. field so um, yeah I definitely like one of the recurring like probably the longest lasting um, injuries I've had from from that time playing ultimate was I was just so obsessed with getting faster and I'm definitely 
like as someone who's much more naturally suited to endurance sports, I was hell bent on being faster because I didn't, you know, didn't want to be left behind all those guys sprinting around. And I remember I came in here and just like really needed, I was just needed to do box jumps so I could, you know, uh, get that explosive um, training happening. And I just did that, you know, I did too many sessions of it. And then I was trying to progress too quickly to, to become faster and to be able to jump higher. And then I like ended up tearing my labrum in my hip, which is a bit of Ouch. cartilage that um, just provides some passive stability in hip. And, and that's been a, an ongoing issue where I've chosen not to get surgery on it, but I've decided to, you know, vary my training a bit, try and strengthen up the supporting structures around it. And I've been able to go on and, you know, run trail half marathons and yep. play beach volleyball without too many issues. But it was that just like that singular focus on trying to be, you know, too explosive without doing sort of the well-rounded prep work to give your hips sort of a, you know, the yep. strength for it. I know all too well what tearing a labrum's like. I've done the whole anterior portion of my labrum in my left shoulder. And it, um, again, I did, I chose not to have surgery as well, but it's a constant um, process of keeping that area of the body nice and strong. Yeah, you know? and absolutely. And it's so good that, you know, you can make those choices to not have surgery because, like surgery comes at its own risks and, and long term, you know, like it can can have some issues. So the fact that, you know, you can support that passive structure just by getting in the gym and doing some targeted exercises, like it, it's, yeah, I've been really happy with how, because I've done my left shoulder as well from Frisbee and, and my hip and yeah, I've still managed to, to go on and to keep moving, you know, keep yep. going. So but yep. it really, you really notice it when you don't do your strength exercises that um, yep. everything starts to feel a bit, uh, a bit uncomfortable. So. Absolutely. Just quickly, I want to break away. Uh, for the people on the podcast, I apologize for the sound that was in the background before. That was our drinks fridge, and it is incre- increasingly loud. Uh, we've just unplugged it and <laughs> turned it off. So you should be fine now. You'll be able to hear us all right. Uh, while, while we're there, let's, this is a nice crossover into the other topic that we were discussing on the massage table before, which is... What I believe to be quite a large misunderstanding in the um, sport and recreation arena around the correct approach to exercise post-injury. So without um, using too many uh, sort of um, uh, difficult terms for people to understand, what I'm trying to say is people enter injury, enter exercise after injury um, usually in, in, in a much too high intensity. And the way that you sort of, that we had this talk and the way that we, uh, that you put it made a hell of a lot of sense. And it made a big difference to me. At the time I was suffering some pretty severe uh, extensor tendinopathy and uh, I kept basically re- re-aggravating the injury. Do you remember the conversation? Yeah, yeah. Tennis um, elbow is what that also goes by. So for those who've had it before. Yeah, absolutely. Painful. Absolutely. So... The, the, the big thing that we that, that I think people need to understand, and this is where I think we can give a lot of value today, uh, is the approach when once you've injured yourself and you've been diagnosed correctly, and you give there's usually some period where it, it, whether it, depending on the severity of the injury, if you obviously if you've, if you've had surgical intervention, this period will be a little bit longer before you're able to get back and start the rehab process. And then people generally get some good rehab exercises prescribed by their physio or surgeon, and they do never enough of that, but they do a bit of that, you know. And then they go, okay, it's time to head back into the gym. And in in my experience, in my personal experience, you go with the frame mindset that, okay, I want to enter at the point that I was training in before. So for me, that might have been bench pressing 120 kilos or doing pull-ups with 60 kilos strapped to my, my waist. And I've just come back from uh, tendinopathy in the forearms. Obviously, that gripping is going to re-aggravate the issue, and that's what kept happening. Uh, so talk to me. Let's discuss your um, opinions and what, you, based on your education, based on what you've learned, where people should be, where their mindset should be after post-injury. Yeah, well, I guess the... The big thing with that is that different injuries are so, uh, you know, you have to treat them in very different ways. So there's a big difference between something like a, something like you had, where it's a tendinopathy, an, an abusive load has caused changes in the tendon that then um, uh, you then have to deal with that in quite a different way to uh, a muscle tear or a ligament sprain. Yep. So um, before you go, can you explain in layman's terms? You, you just said there's a change in the tendon. Explain that, discuss that in layman's terms for, yeah. for, the, for the average so, person out there. Yeah, I think uh, 
tissue types can get a bit confusing for people. So just to be very clear, a tendon is what attaches a muscle to a bone and a ligament, which is the one that usually gets confused with that, is um, some soft tissue, uh, yeah, connective tissue that connects bone to bone. So th when we're talking about tendon, it's that, uh, yeah, where your muscle is attaching onto the bone, it's a, a just a, a less contractile, more kind of the thing that's like gluing almost the muscle to the bone. Um, and so a tendinopathy is probably something that you, you, you hear about, um, just, but people generally uh, have a really hard time conceptualizing how to, um, to heal it because the issue there is, is that doing absolutely nothing makes it worse and doing too much makes it worse. So, yeah. um, which is quite different to then a muscle tear or a ligament sprain where you've actually caused a, a tearing in the, in the fibers and you've got to wait for that appropriate healing to happen before you can load it. So, um, this is this. There's, there's a, something that you just said there that I think we need to repeat again because a lot of people get this wrong. Doing absolutely nothing is almost as bad as doing too much. Would you agree? Yeah, it's it's on par. Like you you actually get worse by doing nothing with your with your tendinopathies. Yep. Um. So. Yeah, there's, and, there's and, and what's what most people do, in my opinion, owning a gym and working in gyms for 16 years, most people, when they get tendinopathy, they think, okay, I need to take time off. And yeah, it's, a, it's the, the boom and bust approach to exercise where people go really hard, they overload their, their tissues, they get an abusive load. So that can be, you know, too much weight or um, it can be just you're not prepared for that type of, that type of movement. Um, and so, you know, your classic one might be someone who hasn't played tennis before and then goes for a hit with their friends and then gets that tendinopathy in their extensors. So that's the yep. um, from holding onto the racket and hitting the ball. And that, you know, even if it's just a casual game of tennis, people don't think of that as something that's overtraining, but it's a stimulus and an, a load that your body is not used to. And so even one session like that can start to make changes it within the tendon. Um, and yeah, then you've got to deal with that appropriately. So very common in a gym where someone comes in hasn't done any training before and has seen you know exercises on youtube they want to give a go and so they try and do you know a, a bunch of pull-ups and get a, a flexor tendinopathy this time so that's on the inside of your elbow um which is why i really like the approach that you guys have in this gym where every single exercise you do has a progression and, and regression and the regression here is a really important one because you take the time to to give the the tendons and ligaments time time to um, thicken up and deal with the load before getting into the more technical and and heavier loaded exercises like a pull up yep so yeah that's the really important piece of this is that when you have a, a tendinopathy so you might have an achilles tendinopathy um hamstring forearms and and uh are probably the most common type of tendinopathy as you see yep. you want to you want to keep it loaded and start to build up its resilience to load um, instead of just going for the uh, total bust, which is, you know, let it heal um, and suddenly it will be as strong as it was before because that's yeah. just unfortunately not how it works. Not well, actually, I think fortunately because it's with exercise, you know, the most important thing is that you keep consistent and yep. um, knowing and having that confidence that you can actually continue doing something, stay in your routine, keep with your, you know, the social interaction of, you know, going to your gym class or, or um, well, the exercise, I think, is a really positive thing. So I think it, it, it's great that, um, you know, but yep. you just got to, it can be a bit tricky getting that, that loading right. Yep. So, okay, let's take a jump back. For those listening who are sitting at home right now going, oh, well, I'm, I'm injured. Where do I go from here? Let, just to reinforce, you absolutely should be, in, 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 unless, uh, it's, it, as Phil pointed out before, it's a, it's a full-on muscle tear, you know. Um, there's a difference between tendonitis and a muscle tear, obviously, yeah. and there needs to be time to heal a muscle tear because reopening the wound is, is, is obviously going to do it, not, not do it any justice. Yeah. Uh, but if someone's got like an overuse injury, which is very, very common in gyms, and they're sitting at home going, well, every time I pick something up or try to do something or go and do my bicep curls or whatever, it re-aggravates it. Uh, what should I be doing? The two most common ones that we come across here are um, supraspinatus issues, inflammation in the shoulder, uh, and obviously forearms. And there's some patella tendon issues as well that are quite common, you know, in people. And they're mostly overuse injuries, you know. So let's talk about that. Let's discuss that a little bit. Um, the the entry point what should someone do in your opinion uh i guess it's going to vary depending on the type of injuries so with that um the 
the shoulder one, so that's supraspinatus, which is one of the rotator cuff muscles. So they're the muscles that uh, just try and hold the ball in the middle of the socket in the shoulder joint. So the reason why that one would start to get a tendinopathy is generally because of the um, poor movement coordination of your of your scapula. And so the, the shoulder is an interesting joint in that the only bone attaching it to the rest of your body is the collarbone and then it's just a free-floating scapula and arm attached to it. So the shoulder is a pretty interesting and, and separate case where it's all about getting that um, movement coordination right, which is generally getting the muscle balance right. So um, that one's going to be a bit different to uh, to the rest of your your body because that one's very easy to re-aggravate because you, if you just continue to do you know any overhead movement, you're probably going to pinch it, um, which would be quite different to uh, something like the the the, the quadricep or the um, forearms yep. and so uh, with those ones generally you know it's it's the loading is going to be a bit more kind of consistent with you know your movement and so just the best way to start there is obviously go see a physio and get it get it assessed and make sure that that's exactly what is going on because it's easy to get on dr google and say like oh i have some of these symptoms but having <laughs> someone who's actually trained to be able to distinguish between different diagnoses that do look the same yep. is very important because sometimes you know you can just miss the boat and do something potentially damaging yep. but all that aside if you do have a tendinopathy um then a really good way of very introducing load is through isometric contractions and so um, isometric basically means that you're, um, the muscle's contracting, but the joint is not moving. So, yep. you know, for example, it might be holding my kombucha, yep. uh, holding it, you know, in front of me like this. It's a, um, you know, my bicep is working here to hold my, my elbow at parallel so I don't spill my kombucha. Um, and so that way I'm loading that bicep, t t um, but it's not moving anywhere. Whereas if I wanted to bring that kombucha to my mouth, I'd be having to use a uh, concentric contraction. So that means that the muscle is, is shortening uh, and moving the joint so I can take a sip. And then as I'm lowering it down, that's going to be an e eccentric contraction of, um, of my bicep to uh, resist gravity and lower that um, bottle of kombucha down. So that's just a, a basic sort of introduction to the different types of contractions. And those contractions have a big um, impact on how your uh, muscle is working and how your muscle is going to feel. So I'm sure if you've ever been to the um, the gym and had to do like lots of you know slow squats where you're taking a long time um, lowering down, or maybe you're like a really good example is like if you've gone for a gone for your first jog and you've been like oh I'll take it easy and I'll just run down the hill because you know running up the hill is too hard and the next day you can't walk because your quads are feel like they're you know Super torn to shreds. Sure. Yep. Um, that's an example of you've done a lot of eccentric contractions just try and slow that bending of your knee as you're running downhill and they are the most uh, I guess I'd say damaging because you're lengthening your muscles under tension and that's going to cause lots of micro tears and that's really important that you get those micro tears because that's actually what makes you stronger but they're going to be the most painful so going back to the tendinopathy um, uh, discussion on the forearm doing an isometric contraction you can see how the muscles the fibers aren't moving and so that means it's going to uh, I guess you're going to have less opportunity for the the muscle tearing and you're going to introduce load um, and, and give the structure time to get a bit stronger then you'd, after going through a phase of um, isometric training, uh, which the other great thing about isometrics is also there's really good evidence to show that it's quite pain relieving. So um, instead of you know popping a few pills and, and trying to make it feel better, you can actually um, do some isometric training to get like immediate pain relief. Yep. Um, and then once you've gone through some isometric, adding in co the concentric part of the movement, which is going to be the muscle shortening. Um, yep. So again, the lifting your kombucha to the mouth of the bicep. Um, and so that's you can see how the, because the muscle doesn't have to lengthen under tension, there's going to be less of that muscle damage, so less chance for that um, tendinopathy to be aggravated, basically. Yep. And then the real key piece is adding in that eccentric. That eccentric is going to be the thing that makes your um, tendon really resilient long term because when you add in eccentric training, that's going to be the thing that um, really strengthens up that uh, muscle and tendon, makes it be able to deal with um, you know higher load levels. So the most important part is to get that eccentric um, training in a really um, uh, structured sort of way. Because the important thing here is you're, 
and, and the thing that's kind of hard for patients a lot of the time is you have to work with like with some pain yep. and so the general idea that pain equals bad um, is actually not how it works in, in, in tendinopathy. So it yep. can be really tricky when you go to the physio and they're like, oh, I'll do this thing that hurts. And you're like, why would I want to do the thing that hurts? Yep. Um, so the important part with that is that it's actually um, the better thing to look at is 24 hour pain. So the next day when you wake up, has it got worse? Um, if it has, then you've gone too hard the day before and you go to try and readjust. And so that's why seeing a physio who has a really good idea about that, um, those progressions is, is, is very important. Yep. So. Uh, that's a lot to take in there. But, so, um, so to summarise, entry point is isometrics. Yep. Then where do we take it from there? So adding in the concentrics. So in this case, you know, if we're using the bicep, so if you've got the bicep tendinopathy, um, would be the bicep curl. So bringing the you know the cambodja up to your mouth. Yep. yep. Um, and so that way you're you're adding in some some strength. And so to you know a lot of you who are paying attention would have said like well how do you get back to the start position without doing the eccentric so in this case you not, might actually take your other arm and lower and help lower the weight down yep. so it's not doing as much eccentric load yep um and so you go through a you know a, a um, the common one if you have this for Achilles is you're, you're on the side of the step and you're going up onto your toes um, on one leg and then you're using the other leg to lower back to down. Come back down. Yep. So it's these kind of... Um, so you deload on the way back yeah, down so to you just reduce that, the impact of the eccentric contraction. It, exactly, yep. exactly. Until yep. you've built up a bit more resilience, um, those you're not getting the 24-hour pain with the, that style of training and then you can progress onto the eccentrics. Yep. So if we're looking at that Achilles again, um, it might be... Uh, yeah, slow lowering from going on your tippy toes down to past the bottom of the step or yep. the lowering the kombucha from your mouth. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep, yep, yep. Nice analogy. And by the way, we're not actually plugging kombucha, uh, uh, but we do drink a lot of it because it's very good for your stomach and it's only 27 calories. <laughs> this is my first time I'm, drinking kombucha, so... Really? Uh, yep. Really? Thank and you what do you this. think? Do you like it? Yeah, I mean... I'm. I generally don't like sweet drinks, and so this one's nice because it's only just got that little touch of lemon. Yep. Yeah. We're yeah, drinking so. um, ginger and lemon um, organic remedy kombucha for anyone who's interested, uh, and it's really, really nice. Only 27 calories. It's got good um, bacteria. Anyone who doesn't know kombucha, because there's a lot of people. Uh, I actually got pulled up on the bus the other day because I had a bottle of kombucha, and the bus driver thought that it was a beer. So for those people out there that think that we're sitting here drinking a nice chilled lager on a Friday morning, we're not. Uh, but next week we will be because we've actually got a guest coming on who we're going to be looking at some wine uh, and organic wine and talking about the difference, but I'll get to that later. It's not beer. It's actually fermented tea and it's very, very good for your gut. And because your gut is directly linked to your brain, I believe it's very, very good for your brain. And I think science will prove that eventually that good gut health means good brain health. Anyway, back to our story. So isometrics then eccentrics then no try again sorry isometrics then concentrics then eccentrics and this is interesting and because i have actually taught this wrong in the past i've taught people to do isometric eccentric then concentric and eccentric yep so the thing is with that like you know this is looking at a very prescriptive very like you know step by step sort of best case scenario um yep. But, you know, like a lot of the time people will do those isometrics and that will kind of improve it to the point where eccentrics are probably fine to reintroduce. And you can use that 24 hour pain as the as the guide. And I'm sure that plenty of, um, you know, of your clients who have you've taught that to have got better because yep. it's it's still like, you know, a whole lot better than them going in and doing um, doing like, you know, pull up straight away, like doing those gentle eccentrics is going to be, you know, not exactly suddenly, you know, tearing your um, any muscles in there like it, yep. it's still going to be a gradual reintrodu reintroduction to learn yep. so yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about like the finer details but if we're just looking at a very like you know yep. specific very clinical way. well look yep. it's good I, I've learned something new today myself which is fantastic and we're always learning over here at Unity Gym which I, I'm totally comfortable admitting uh, the the I think the last thing so so We've covered the approach to exercise uh, more specifically for tendonitis. And uh, the reality is, guys, that um, Phil and I could sit here and talk all day about uh, injury rehab, progressive overload, and all the things that I think are really important and going to give value. And because of the fact that he is an absolute 
treasure chest of knowledge uh, I'm definitely going to have you back on the show if, you, if you're uh, if you're yeah, okay no, with that. that. I would yeah. love to because we could we, we, we there's so much more we could talk about, and I'm sure you guys will agree when you watch this or when you're listening to the podcast at home um, that, that that there's been some cracking gold, um, r- real gold nuggets of, of uh, knowledge come out of this discussion. So we'll definitely do this again. Uh, the the final take home I think probably um, that I'd like you to tip on is the the big difference between a torn muscle and an overused muscle and just very quickly um with a torn muscle so that's like an it's usually a single incident um like a trauma yeah, more commonly. um that that doesn't need any surgical intervention what would you say to someone just in case there's someone sitting at home who's just been told that they've torn their bicep or something like that uh it's a totally different ball game right yeah, I mean, you've got to think about, like, tissue healing time. So generally, you know, zero to 72 hours, you've got your, um, just that inflammation phase where you just really, you know, you've got, like, bleeding for 10 hours and then you've got um, just that real inflammatory stage where you just want to let that kind of play out. You know, the do you use anti-inflammatories or not, do you ice it or not is still, like, a really interesting topic, but general wisdom is at the moment, you know, ice that and just help it, yep. um, you know, settle down a bit. And then you've got... Um, like six weeks until that muscle generally like depending on grade obviously yep. is gonna is really gonna just quickly you. explain the grades grade one two and three yeah so uh if we're looking at grade three that's going to be a complete rupture so the muscle so totally two muscles half, and generally you'll need um two muscles that are completely detached yeah yep. so you'll need uh generally surgical intervention to reattach those muscles yep um grade two is a very big spectrum of could be holding on by a few muscle like fibers to like a uh, significant tear and a grade one is generally there's not really like any like uh i mean it's a, a minor a minor tear like it's yep. it's a very much a, a spectrum so grade here, one's so. the one that most of the time people sustain really yeah yeah, yeah like you, you'd probably be doing something pretty aggressive to get a, a grade two yep. um a grade one you know is, is a bit easier to so that classic like strain i guess yeah yeah um yeah so i guess like the big thing with that um so yeah you've got the six weeks of muscle healing um uh and then like, and then you've still got another 12 months where sort of you've got changes going on. So, um, like, you, you, you really want to let it settle down, start to reintroduce load. So the isometrics is a really safe way generally of, of training it, but you're using pain sort of differently in that way where, you know, generally you don't want to be stressing out the muscle too much. Yep. Um, but again, see your physio and get a real, a real good plan for this. Yep. Um, and then, you know, looking forward once you've, got back to you know past that six weeks and there's, there's still the um the fibers are still going to be like healing i guess over the next 12 months you really just want to set them up to be as strong as possible and also look why the injury happened in the first place so my classic example was tearing my hamstrings four times while um sprinting an ultimate frisbee and uh did lots of glute activation exercises at the physio because they told me i had lazy glutes and then i kept tearing them and then i went and worked with a running coach down in canberra um and he just taught me how to run properly and yeah really it was that change of you know actually shortening my stride length um picking up my cadence a bit less rotation through my upper body that meant that i didn't i could load my glutes appropriately not overstretch my hamstrings and i've never torn my hammy again wow so there's an interesting thing there where you've got to think about you know why why you're getting these these tears as yeah, well so. yeah yeah absolutely that's a really good point actually you know like and this is something that i can't stress enough guys <clears throat> seek out people who know more than you and learn from them and work with them you know if you're at a gym just smashing your body day in day out uh it might not be the best approach for you if you keep hurting yourself you know you may need to have a look at what you're doing and may and try and align yourself with someone who's going to um uh, know more than you to train you and don't make it some dude that just reads lots of muscle magazine yeah like find, yeah, I mean, it's find a, a trainer or a coach example. so yeah like you know this these physios are giving me advice that were like these physios didn't run like mm. they <laughs> like they'd sort of learn stuff from a textbook and you know like i spent a lot of time learning from a textbook but you know you go and do a session with this guy lex anderson down in canberra who's like been working with you know kids in the ais for years and yep. he's run competitively himself and like you know he's seen like he says that like physios are his best business because they keep injuring his, his people and they come to him and you know yep. have to get running retraining so um yeah it's, it's about finding those people who are real experts in the field they live and breathe the stuff so you know for him like for, for running that's a great example for the gym coming in here and training with you guys who you know you've done you've been in the gym for what 
how many years 16, now? Well, yeah, exactly. More, and, 25 years. And in you've my tried own different training, approaches. Yeah. You have your experience in bodybuilding. So when people come in here and say they want to yeah. bodybuild, you can tell them with, you know, with, yeah. a, with experience and background that maybe, you know. That maybe it's not the right thing. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm joking. It, no offense, bodybuilders. I, um, I love yeah, you all. But just trying to find <laughs> those people that um, can give you really, you know, good personal, like, background experience advice as well as having a bit of knowledge to back it up absolutely absolutely listen i we have to wrap it up with phil here i'm staying on but um phil's got to go and and uh treat someone at 10 o'clock and we've run a little bit over time because I, i took a while to get started i want to just thank you man it's been absolutely awesome having you on and uh i'm sure everyone who listens to this will agree um (laughs) <laughs> Kalisha's commenting on there. Yeah, great point. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. Yeah, really appreciate and, it. And um, we'll do this again. I'll get right. up and shake your hand because we're on the high cam, so you can say <laughs> goodbye to everyone up there. Thanks a lot. Really let's, enjoyed it. Let's do this again soon yep. um, because, man, Christ, there's so much we can talk yeah, about and there's a lot of value that. that we can give. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, quickly, just before you go, uh, you guys can find Phil down at Cartwright Physical Therapy at the moment. Yep. Um, because of his study regime, he is only very limited. Uh, bookings are fairly scarce. And uh, uh, so you've got to make sure that you get in with him. Give him a call. Um, where, where's the best place that they can book in with you? Yeah, I mean, we have an online booking system, so that's probably the easiest way to do it. So head through to my Instagram page, which is Phil White Massage, or go onto the Cartwright Physical Therapy website. Website, and, yep, and book, and in, book in, yep. So. And you'll find Phil there. He is one of the head massage therapists, or the massage therapist down there, really. Uh, a new guy, very excited to, yeah, to yeah. do some swaps and see how he goes. Give, give him a go, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, Phil, thank you very much, brother. Appreciate I'll it. let you go, I won't hold you up. I don't want Enjoy to day. screw with your day. <laughs> see you soon. Um, see you soon, brother. Take care, thank you. All right, folks. Uh, That was epic. I hope you enjoyed listening to Phil. I'm just going to fix my monitor up here. Uh, All right. So what are we going to talk about now? I've got a couple of little things that I want to tip on uh, before we wrap up today. And um, one of them is motivation based. Uh, Anyone who's exercising right now, I was talking to my tribe this morning about it. We've got you know, we're coming, we've got the last two weeks of winter, then we come into summer and uh, it becomes a, an easier time to exercise because we have, uh, you know, we, we, as, as animals, we get energized by the sun and as it comes into that summer month, we obviously get a little bit more outdoors time. We get a bit more natural vitamin D production in the bodies. We become a little bit more energized and motivated and enthusiastic. See you, mate, take care. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, but, you know, for, 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 for all of our tribe here at Unity, I, I congratu- I've been congratulating everyone for making it through one of the toughest times of the year, which is winter, you know, getting up at the crack of dawn, getting into the gym, training. Uh, for anyone out there that's sitting, uh, sitting on their butt who's, you know, really thinking about wanting to make changes in their life, You've got to take action right now because the longer you leave it coming into summer, the more you're gonna fall behind the eight ball and you've got a whole world moving fast paced around you. Take the first step. All you need to do to get started is to get yourself through the door. You've got to make sure that you're moving forward. One of the keys to happiness in life is a, is a, is a feeling of progress. This is something that we talk about a lot down here. We even called our class the progressions class. Um, because that they've found uh, social psychologists have studied you know w- what key elements we need for true happiness in life and it's nothing materialistic guys it's 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 a sense of progress so if you feel like you've gotten through winter and you've only just survived and you you know you're dragging your feet you're feeling a bit miserable now is the time to take action and get yourself moving, whether it's starting to run, whether it's starting a yoga class, heck, get down here to Unity and we'll help you get moving. There's a great initiative going on with the Australian government. It's called Move Australia and uh, it's, it's good. It's just, it's just encouraging people to take up more physical activity. 30 minutes a day is their goal. We try and get people to do an hour a day here at Unity. We have a five day a week program that aligns with people's working weeks. 
um, you know, jump on board this and get yourself going. You will not believe how much, how better you feel. Uh, I'm reading a great book at the moment called The Brain's Way of Healing by Norman Doidge. It's the sequel book to The Brain That Changes Itself. It is an epic book, and and they're they're really looking at the the, you know, we know that exercise influences health on many different levels, but what they're finding now around neural brain plasticity and the way that the brain heals itself, exercise is an integral part and it doesn't even need to be super high intensity exercise. What they've found is it has to be progressive, so it has to start easy and slowly progress to more difficult, um, sort of higher intensity, longer duration, higher frequency exercise. Uh, that's essential, but exercise in itself is so, so powerful. Uh, it, it, it heals brain disorders, it heals obviously body ailments, it does all of that great stuff. Let's get moving, move more Australia and jump on the back of that um, government initiative, it's a good thing. Anyway guys, uh, that is pretty much all we have time for today. I'm not going to do a study review today because we just didn't get ourselves organized in time. Uh, if you've been listening on the Sound of Movement podcast, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Phil. The last thing I want to talk about is our guest coming next week. Uh, you may find this quite strange that we're getting a, um, a wine guru on the show uh, Dan is a very close friend of ours. He's also a client down here, a member at Unity Gym. Now, uh, we, uh, I'm a very big firm believer of the benefits of resveratrol and so I allow myself a little bit of red wine, but it has to be very moderated because on a personal level, I have suffered addiction before. And uh, I, I, I very, very quickly fall back into those habit loops of enjoying more than just a glass or two of wine and it becomes an, an addiction again. So I drink moderately, but I was sort of not really aware of the differences in the quality of wine that I was drinking. And I just aimed for red wine usually because it has that resveratrol in it, which is really, really good for the body. It's a, it's a very powerful antioxidant. And it's, uh, it's been proven to be one of the key things that upregulates cell autophagy, which is the cell's process of healing and restoring itself. Um, and, and we want that. We want an upregulation of, of, of cell autophagy. That's another, it's also one of the reasons why I am a big advocate of intermittent fasting uh, and time delayed eating methods. But um, what I didn't realize about red wine and any wine for that matter, and beer as well, is that it is full of preservatives. The majority of wine that we drink straight from a bottle shop or a liquor store is, uh, is, is, is mass produced. And there's a very big difference between how mass produced wine and, uh, and wine from sort of more boutique vineyards is produced. And I didn't know this. Sitting down and having a 10 minute chat with, uh, with Dan, our guest for next week, completely changed my entire outlook on uh, the wine uh, that we're drinking. And it made me realize that there is a lot of value that we can give to our audience uh, having him on the show because he is a wealth of knowledge uh, and he has a company where they only really source the highest quality uh, wines and most of them are organic or biodynamic. He, he even sources 100% pure wine, which uh, he, I've never tried, but he tells me is, uh, is, is a really particular drop that you have to you have to really like your wine to appreciate it because it doesn't taste uh, uh, that good apparently apparently I've never tried it uh, it's something that I will definitely try in the future but anyway I'm not going to give too much away because uh, I'm really excited to have him on the show next week if you are a wine drinker or a craft beer drinker this is one that you definitely don't want to miss uh, I'm really looking forward to it uh, that's going to be on Tuesday. We're going live at about nine o'clock. Uh, hopefully we're, we're more on time. Until then, for you watching UniTV, it is over and out. Thank you very, very much for joining us this week. I hope you liked uh, what Phil had to say. There was some massive knowledge bombs in there. We will have him on the show again soon. Uh, we've had some great feedback having Tom on the show last week. We will get Tom back again soon as well. Uh, they're our resident um, uh, physical therapists, so we're, we're lucky to have them close by. 
Uh, and next week, join us to, to meet uh, our friend Dan uh, Radford and uh, learn about healthy, good quality wines and the difference. That's it, folks. Thank you very much for joining us. I will see you next week. For those listening on the podcast, Sound of Movement podcast, uh, we will talk soon. Take care.